All right, if I can have your attention, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started uh, for the evening. Um, as we're getting started, if, uh, if you're in a, in a row where there's maybe a seat in the middle, if you guys can kind of scooch in, we often get people who arrive late. Uh, it'd be nice if they could like maybe sit on the outside and not have to step all over uh, other people as they arrive. So uh, welcome all of you to the Sacramento chapter of the Social Media Club. This is our panel on uh, social media and travel. Uh, so if you're here for something else, now would be a good time for you to you know, <laughs> quietly wall Great, thanks, your eyes. Thanks. <laughs> yes, Adam, Adam. Uh, anyhow, so uh, we're very grateful for you all uh, who've come out here tonight. Uh, I'm Scott Ager. I'm the vice president of the uh, chapter here. And uh, Laura Good is our president, which is hiding back there. Uh, so if less something befalls her, um, I get to be vice president. Great. Um, anyhow, so grateful for you all coming out. Uh, for those of you who this might be your first event, uh, how many people this is a first event, actually? That would be good to know. Tons. Awesome. Love it. So, uh, well, let me introduce you to the Social Media Club. We host... Uh, monthly, sometimes more than one event a month around the use of social media, usually in a professional nature, but really as a way to educate local professionals who want to better utilize social media. Our mission is to really like raise the bar on the use of social media and to be an educational resource and to provide uh, educational opportunities. So we do that by having panels like this. We also have classes, workshops, where we do hands-on, you know, how to do stuff on Facebook or Pinterest or Twitter. And uh, we also have some really fun networking events. And uh, this year, we also have had the really neat opportunity to partner with the Sacramento Business Journal, which we've been really excited about. Uh, they have these events called Connectionopolis, and they're hosted, um, there's seven of them this year, and they basically start in February and will run through August. And there's one coming up this month, uh, April 24th. It's going to be hosted in Davis at Rominger uh, Winery. And uh, it's the 24th of April, and it's at 5 p.m. And we're going to be talking uh, about LinkedIn. So kind of taking LinkedIn beyond the online resume is really what we're going to be talking about. So uh, if you have an interest in that, we'd love to see you guys uh, come out for that as well. So the club is an all-volunteer organization. Nobody here you know, gets paid to run or show up. Um, and uh, again, we're really glad that you guys uh, could come out. We're uh, grateful uh, to our sponsors. Uh, first of all, the Urban Hive, where we're um, located tonight. Mm -hmm. This is a great facility. We've been using the Urban Hive now for a couple of years for a uh, majority of our events. Um, and they've made this available to us, and so uh, we're very grateful for them. Uh, also, our food tonight, uh, if you guys tried the delicious sandwiches up front, those were provided by uh, the Golden Bear restaurant, so we want you guys to definitely uh, give them some love in the Twitter stream tonight, um, which, by the way, you can follow the event online tonight at, if you just follow the hashtag SMCSAC, can, uh, track all the back channel communication uh, that's going on and, and uh, you know, share something. We'd love to see that. Um, also, a uh, longtime sponsor of the club is the Sacramento Press, uh, provided our drinks uh, tonight. Uh, you can find them uh, also on Twitter at Sac Sacramento Press. Is that right, Chris? Sacramento Press. All right. Chris. Yeah. <laughs> He's still checking people in. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so anyway, thank you to the Sacramento Press, uh, longtime uh, loyal sponsors of the club. Um, so without uh, much further ado, uh, again tonight we're talking about uh, travel and social media, oh the places you could go. Uh, I do want to thank tonight our program manager, who's Jamila Khan. Jamila, where are you? Yeah, Jamila. Yeah, Jamila. She is. <laughs> yes, you do want to thank you, Jamila. Ready to for putting this great panel together. And uh, our introductions tonight are gonna be done by uh, our member, uh, Megan Emmerling. Megan is the marketing manager for the Downtown Sacramento Partnership. 
She's been a long time part of the Sacramento chapter of the Social Media Club. She's also going on a little sabbatical. So we also want to take the opportunity to thank her for her work over uh, the last couple of years. And uh, we're hoping she'll be back of course, I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> anyway, so Megan's going to do the uh, panel introduction. Um, I want to introduce to you Lisa <coughs> Martinez, our panel moderator this evening. Lisa is actually my boss at the Downtown Sacramento Partnership. She is our um, Director of Marketing and Outreach. And uh, our team manages a lot of uh, just communication about Downtown Sacramento and all the things that are going on. So uh, we like to call Lisa Downtown's biggest fan. She always knows what's going on uh, in Sacramento and is really excited to tell everybody about it. And she's not a Sacramento native, so she's from Chicago. So she kind of gives that third party endorsement of all the great stuff that's going on in Downtown Sacramento. So Lisa, I'll hand it over to you to introduce the panel. Uh, well, so we have a really great panel uh, for you guys here tonight. Uh, forgive me, they've got some great bios, so I'm going to read to you a little bit, um, and from there we'll go from there. So I'd first like to introduce uh, Christine Amorose. Um, so she's a Sacramento uh, native and a full-fledged full Francophile. Um, she's an aspiring street art photographer and a semi-professional beach bum. Um, since earning her degree in journalism from California State University in Chico in 2009, she's backpacked solo through Europe, bartended on the French Riviera, worked in marketing in Melbourne, and ate at many street carts in Southeast, Southeast Asia. I know she just got back from a couple of big trips, so I'm insanely jealous of her. Uh, she's traveled extensively throughout Europe, um, Australia, Asia, all while eating, uh, writing, tweeting, and Facebooking her adventures as a travel blogger. Uh, you can follow her at Camarose uh, um, on Twitter. Yes, C-A-M-O-R-O-S-E. Um, and then our next panelist is Christy Jordan. Uh, Christy is a travel industry veteran. Uh, she uses social media to chat about travel, wine, and daily life. While many in the travel business saw the proliferation of online travel agencies as the beginning of the end of their careers, Christy has truly embraced technology. Um, she uses that. Uh, she uses that one uh, just one more tool in her arsenal to deliver personal service and create and create value for her clients. Um, she could be found volunteering at her son's school or, uh, or Cub Scouts events, watching her husband's band play, and tasting at her favorite local uh, wineries. Uh, Julie Gallagher, our next panelist. Julie uh, is a jazz singing, baseball loving search engine optimizer who's been travel blogging <laughs> since 2003. Um, she's a former travel agency owner, um, and her goal is to help travelers connect with the independent and quirky businesses that make a destination unique. Um, at thingsyoushoulddo.com, uh, her website, you'll find links to hotels, restaurants, activities, and spa, uh, spas that she loves. Um, she's a social media consultant for the number one destination spa <coughs> in the world, uh, Rancho La Puerta. Uh, you could find her on Twitter at Julie Gallagher or on Pinterest at Julie March. Mark? Yes. Okay. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan is, our, is the owner and president of Moraga Travel, uh, he's a, a, which is a boutique travel agency in Moraga, California. Um, and a media net link, um, a, web, a web development firm and creator of Con Contact Beacon, um, an email marketing system that focuses on the travel industry. Industry. He is also the vice president of the American Society of Travel Agents Young Professionals Society and was named ASTA's Young Professional of the Year in 20, 2011. Kind of a busy guy there. Yeah. Um, as father of three young boys, Ryan likes to say that he travels the world viewing it from the tech geek dad perspective. You could follow him on Facebook at Ryan McGready or on Twitter um, at Ryan McGready as well. Uh, he likes to use both platforms to tell the world what he's having for lunch and <laughs> when he's going to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> gotta follow Ryan. There you go. Um, and finally, we've got Lucas. Um, Lucas currently serves as the online marketing manager for the Fairmont San Francisco in Fairmont Newport Beach. In addition to managing paid and organic search marketing efforts, he is also responsible for social media marketing. This includes strategy and execution of social media efforts. Um, he also earned his MBA from, in marketing from USF. You can follow the Fairmont San Francisco on Facebook at Fairmont SF and on Twitter at Fairmont SF as well. So those are our panelists. Um, what I want to do is kind of get to know everyone a little bit more. You can hear a little bit about their perspective, um, their unique perspective on how uh, the travel industry um, uses social media and how that's changing that industry. Uh, before we get started, a, a quick couple of questions for the audience. How many of you, by show of hands, works within the um, travel industry? 
And how many of you uh, work within marketing or public relations? And one last question. How many of you are brand spanking new to social media, don't really know much about it, but are just starting to get your feet wet? Raise your hands. Well, welcome to all of you guys. Um, I think I'd like to start off just with each one of you guys, just to find out on your day to day, you all have each very unique perspectives from travel blogging to uh, working in, you know, with travel agencies and within um, hotels and destinations. Tell me how you use social media on a day to day basis. Um, within the context of your job and travel. Start with Christine, okay? Um, I use Twitter pretty extensively just to promote my blog, uh, maintain relationships kind of with other bloggers and with readers. Uh, that's a lot of how I communicate with my readers. Facebook as well to kind of get a wider audience for my blog. Um, and now Pinterest is definitely growing as a way for people to find my site. But I tweet, I Facebook, I check in all day long. So, Instagram now. Hey, Christy? Um, I use Twitter just about every day for a myriad of things. I know the more I tweet, the more the name of our brand gets out there. And nothing makes me happier than to be kind of bridal fair at a function and someone say, ships and trips, I've heard of you before. And I was like, my work is done. But otherwise, I use it personally to connect with other local businesses. We are a small, independent, Sacramento area businesses. We love to support the same. So if a favorite restaurant, winery, if the uh, Chevy dealership in El Dorado Hills has a special, I retweet and share because I feel like we're all in business in town together to support each other. I uh, use Twitter to uh, enhance my friendships with people who are other travel bloggers and other people who are sort of in the lifestyle blogging category, whether, you know, gardening, wine, um, fun, that type of thing. So I, I use that a lot. I do the same on um, Pinterest, which is my new complete and total addiction. That um, if you Facebook me, I might not answer right now because I'm hardly there. <laughs> I, uh, I'm really a face to face networker at heart, and so before there was social networking, I was a really bad friend. I never called people, I never emailed them, I never reached, sent letters, never did any of that stuff. But uh, since, you know, first being on MySpace, and finding Twitter and Facebook and doing all that stuff, I really like it because I see it as an extension of face-to-face -face networking. It's a way to sort of carry on a conversation on a large scale. Because I'm a person who has a lot, I make friends pretty easily and I have a lot of friends that I really like talking to my friends and, and having that stuff. So I, I uh, and I'm, you know, kind of a nerd when it comes to new tech stuff. So I always got to go try everything out. I read uh, TechCrunch and Mashable pretty voraciously. So anytime there's a new like opportunity to be a beta user on something, I'm checking it out. Uh, and the ones that I find are successful are the ones that sort of enhance that just big conversation that I'm having in general in life. So I don't. Uh, I don't tend to do too much um, sort of specific product placement or uh, you know trying to drive people to, to links. Or I just have it sort of happen organically. I, I use it as a place to show what I'm doing and the things I'm sort of uh, journaling my actions. And then my friends and the people that follow me tend to just go and check that stuff out organically. So on behalf of the hotel, I mostly focus on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, Pinterest we've started to use, but on a very, very small scale, just because pretty much the people that are on Pinterest, corporate has established that they aren't necessarily our target market at this time. Uh, as far as Twitter, it's more of a conversational tool slash customer service. Facebook, it's kind of get the word out about what's going on, trying to drive traffic. Ultimately, we're always trying to drive traffic back to our site and gain people within our uh, loyalty club, which is Fairmont President's Club, so those are pretty much the main reasons. Okay. Well, I noticed um, there were a couple of trends that you guys said, Facebook, Twitter, um, and Pinterest seem to be coming up pretty often. Pinterest is seems to be one of those, it's one of my guilty pleasures too, I can't, I had, a, I had to cut back a little bit recently, but so for, I mean, from the hotel's perspective, Pinterest is, it doesn't fit in with that core audience, um, but how are you guys using Pinterest, um, and, and how is that? How does that fit within the people that you're talking to, um, and how do you see there's a benefit to, to your work? Um, I think that I love Pinterest as well, and I think that 
especially as a travel blogger, a lot of people tend to live vicariously through me and my travel. So I think as a travel blogger, you kind of become a brand mm -hmm. of your own. So I see my travel boards, my Pinterest <coughs> boards, as people kind of following along what I'm interested in, where I want to go, and where I've been, and a lot of my photos. I also find um, that it's a growing traffic source just with people who enjoy my photography who are pinning a lot of my photos onto the site, and that's doing a bit of work for me in terms of pushing people to my site and bringing them those. So. And, and do you engage, I mean, a lot of your content sounds like it's coming directly from you. Are you are brands or destinations engaging with you on Pinterest? Are they using you to some degree? <coughs> I haven't noticed uh, that as much. I think that brands right now are still kind of figuring out how to use Pinterest. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't seen as many travel sites using it directly to contact me or to do any direct marketing on Pinterest. Okay. But still new. What's your take on it? Okay, so I've had a beta Pinterest account since it first came out in beta, and there's not one thing on it. And I get emails all the time that people are following me on Pinterest, and seriously, there's not one thing on it, because I have not had time to explore it. Now I'm looking at my boss and telling her that the most popular social media outlet has nothing on it. But that's because I don't just want to sort of throw stuff at it. I do feel like there's a way to be creative and use it properly. Um, it's growing faster than anything else right now, but it's also new. A year from now, who knows what that will be. Um, so, you will see a Ships and Ships board on Pinterest. Am I going to repost the same beach photos that everyone else is photoing? No. I have an idea of how to sort of make it specific, like these are the best beaches to get married on, or that kind of approach. Um, to really make it as all of our social media is, our personal opinion. Here's where we like to go have coffee if we're in New York. Here's where we like to have a slice of pizza if we're in Naples. And go from that perspective and Pinterest will be. But so far, nothing. It's all right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be awesome. It's right here. Yes. Yes. I can see that. That's right. Yeah. Julie, how about you? Well, I think that if I was talking to the Fairmont, I would say think about that idea again about your audience not being there. Because one of the things that to me is so exciting about Pinterest is that the content that you put out doesn't die immediately. So I put a Facebook post out and it has a life of about three hours. If I put a tweet out, it has a life of about a half an hour. If I put a pin up, eight weeks later, it might get repinned by someone and cycle through and start the channel again. So mm -hmm. I've had more interaction on, on Pinterest than in anything that I've done. And I was a MySpacer and, you know, I've been blogging a long time. And I've got pins that, you know, a hundred times someone has repinned it, that type of thing, that I never have had on anything else. So especially the idea that, so someone says, okay, here is, um, Julie has, I have a new board that is Perfect Weekend Mill Valley. And it could be a year from now, people are still going to it and going, oh, look at that, I wanna, you know, I like that, I want that on my deal. So, why yeah. not? I, I'm <coughs> sort of a similar situation to Christy. I think I had a very early beta mm -hmm. account on Pinterest, and I think that maybe they chose the wrong beta users because mm -hmm. I, I went through it all through, and I'm like, I don't get it. It's delicious bookmarks with pictures, right? And uh, and then I but they their first sort of way of illustrating it was with uh, like painting clothes that you like on Pinterest. So I brought it home and I showed it to my wife. And I'm like, you might like this. You know, you can. Because you're all, she has a million bookmarks in her Firefox of you know different things she wants to come back and buy, and she likes to share them with her friends or something. Oh, you might like it. She looked at no, it's it's not for me. Well, now it's all she does. It's all <laughs> and it's because she um, she's like, you got to see this site that my friend sent me and shows me like. What, what do you mean? I just gave you a beta invite to this site like a year ago, <laughs> but it can't. But I, I agree. I think uh, it's making me relook at it because you know we look at all of the um, research we look at from a, a travel business perspective, from a travel agency perspective, and it says all the vacation decisions get made by the women of the household that are between a certain age demographic. So for us, that's our target demographic mm -hmm. is my wife, you know, and and her and all of her friends love it. That's they're on there more than Facebook now, and uh, so yeah, I'm definitely I'm in Christie's camp now where I'm starting to have ideas and say, oh, well, I need to come back and relook at that as a platform that uh, that 
that we need to look at. Maybe your wife can do it for both of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's something to be said about um, making sure you have the right content for the right media. Um, you know, maybe you guys could talk a little bit about when you're looking at content, um, what content is appropriate for what social media channel? And maybe I should start off with first, you know, what is your go-to? If you're looking at your, your content strategy for your company, your blog, your organization, um, what, what is your goal when you're using um, a specific channel? And, and what is your, you know, if I was on Desert Island, I had one tool, um, and that's a hard question to answer, but what would be, what have you seen the best results from, and, and what were those results? That's a tough question. Uh, we basically apply different strategies for the content to the separate channels. Uh, with Twitter, it's more of a conversational slash customer service tool. Generally, people will tweet at the hotel before they arrive or if they're having any uh, issues while they're there or even post-stay. Um, we use it for getting out, like for instance, if there's a blog posting about us or an article that I find about us, that's not necessarily something that, at least in our past, has gotten that much engagement with on Facebook, but we see it more retweeted on, on Twitter, for instance. Facebook, it's more kind of showing what's going on with the hotel. For instance, last week we had the launch of a honey beer we had brewed in collaboration with the local brewery. So that's kind of, we notify people of the event via that and then share that event on Facebook. So it's kind of more of a, a two-way conversation. Are you seeing, um, specific because you're one specific location, are you seeing check-ins or um, with Facebook or with Foursquare are areas that you find to be of, of value to the organization? Um, I would say kind of a questionable value at this point, but what's kind of interesting is even though Foursquare was in the location business before uh, Facebook was, we, we did put some effort into Foursquare, but we weren't just, we just weren't seeing that much activity. Mm -hmm. Facebook check-ins, on the other hand, I think lifetime check-ins are seven times uh, what four square are. Wow. So it's kind of counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, what, what's been your experience with content, uh, managing content, and what channels, or what, what messaging is appropriate for which <coughs> channels? I, uh, for me, and what I'm trying to accomplish with my stuff, I think Facebook's sort of the best medium for me because uh, most of what I'm trying to do is build relationships with potential customers and, and so it's really about uh, and sort of show my expertise that I'm going places that I'm seeing things that I have my mm -hmm. you know my feet on the ground in places I'm staying at certain hotels I'm you know checking out the destinations and uh, Facebook sort of gives me the the best tool for that because um, I can you know I can post anything from a status up to and, and have it all there on, on the page mm -hmm. and have sort of the running timeline all encapsulated in my own so are you liking the new um, Facebook? Uh, I do like the new timeline stuff. I do. Too. I do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I always like the new Facebook. Like it, I'm always the one guy where He's everyone's like, ah, oh, <laughs> down with the new Facebook. I hate it. And I was like, what? I love this. This is great. I can do this now. I can do this now. I don't miss anything that's going on. So I've got that stream. That's great. What's, you know. What's the uh, best tool that you've seen on the new Facebook timeline? If you're saying, you know. It, it, other than it looks cool, what, what have you seen that is, you know, this is really helpful for business, specifically for the travel industry? For me, I love the fact that you could pin an item and have it hang at the top of your page for up to a week at a time. So we have our big spring travel event coming up Sunday, April 29th. <laughs> Scott is right. But, you know, so I can create an announcement about that and elect for it to be the top of the page. Um, I love that. And then after a week, it defaults to go into the timeline, or I can repin it. I also like that you can expand. So if we have a beautiful photo, I love to share clients' photos. If we have a client traveling, I love to get an email from them saying, look, this is me here or doing something. And I will immediately share it with their permission. And you can share it broad across the whole top of the timeline. So it just really pops. And I hope that it excites our clients to want to do the same. Yeah, I think uh, the, that it's photo-centric is really a good mm -hmm. thing. Um, instead of the pictures being tiny, they, they sort of take up the most of the page because um, for us, the way people buy travel is very emotional and uh, the pictures sort of get that more than, you know, having a bunch of text and then having to go and click on pictures. Yeah. If you have something that's staring you on the face that, you know, if you have on your head that you need a vacation and you click on something that's a beach in Maui is staring you in the face, then you're like, oh, whoa, I, you know, maybe I really do need to think about booking that vacation right now. 
picture says, what, what is it? The picture says a thousand words? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Julie, what about you? I would say that the uh, Twitter is the best way to meet new people. Mm -hmm. And so meeting new people who are um, people that I can network with or people who might like my content, um, the fact that you know, the, the communication is condensed, means that there's a lot of people that go by and you can look for things. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, that has been something that's been really important to me over time. But, like, can you give me an example of how you've met someone that, that's been, you know, like a, just well, a surprise? what about us? We can go to lunch and everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, you can um, search, uh, you can um, poach other people's lists. You know, so you know somebody. Um, I have a lot of people that I am pals with who are among the top travel bloggers in the world. And so I um, am almost eavesdropping on their conversations and you can find people who, you know, you feel like you're in sync with them. And so that's somebody to pay more attention to and to retweet. And because the internet in general is so reciprocal, I find that you know, it, it takes such a small amount of effort to make a new friend, to, you know, somebody, if most people have something that they're doing that they, um, that they're promoting, mm -hmm. and if you retweet, like you were saying about the, um, the Chevy dealers thing, you retweet their message, those people are paying attention. Mm -hmm and are grateful that you have helped them out with that. So it's that one-on-one -on -one conversation aspect. You may not be in the same room, but you can talk mm -hmm. with someone directly mm -hmm. and, and jump in. Yeah, I remember uh, back in the, I guess, late 80s, early 90s, we, uh, my dad was working at Apple Computer, and so we got to be uh, one of the beta users on uh, America Online before it was even called mm -hmm. that. And I remember, Doing the uh, going on all the chat rooms in there and the the network that sort of came out of those chat rooms and then later on when I got to be a, you know a teenager it was like IRC and doing those things and Twitter is really sort of like the next logical progression of that because it's it's really sort of the same kind of feel I think mm -hmm. it, you know you make these these bonds with people because they tend to share things more in sort of a chat format and then you've got sort of the hashtags and things to sort of group it to group it around but then it uh, all it does is it, it makes it a little bit more uh, it introduces the element of following people as well as topics, right? So uh, you get all that going on. But yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a better format for just sort of going open conversation. Like Twitter's for meeting people and Facebook's for talking to who you know already, mm -hmm. right? That's a great analogy. And I, I learned so much from Twitter, and it really helps with my clients because I try to keep up with people from all over the world. And you know, someone like Lucas, if I have a client checking into his property, I'm tweeting him the moment they book. And not just me, but any of our 100 plus agents, they'll let me know the moment they book, and then a couple days before arrival, and then a couple hours estimated before their arrival, I say, here's our clients, treat them like gold. This is why we do it. And the other thing is, if I have a client going to a particular destination, um, it's really easy to find a five-star hotel. Our challenge is always to find a nice, moderate hotel, the quality we can count on, that helps. Um, when I found out Celebrity was going to position a brand new cruise ship in Bayonne, New Jersey, and I know nothing of Bayonne, New Jersey, well, I know there's another travel agent there that's on Twitter. I immediately got on Google Plus and arranged a um, uh, hangout, mm -hmm. and he gave us an overview. This is Bayonne, New Jersey, and here's how it looks, and here's where the port is, and here's how to get there, and helped me so that I can go on and help my clients better. That wouldn't have happened through Facebook in the way that it happened through Twitter. The relationship wouldn't have started it's that way. You jump from one medium to another. You mentioned Google Plus. Mm -hmm. um, so you said you mentioned Hangouts. Has anyone else used Hangouts, or is anyone else using Google Plus for business? Or again, almost like Pinterest, but to a very small degree. I mean, since we are a brand with six more than sixty-five properties, we kind of have our our initiatives are decided at the corporate level, and it's kind of. You know, if you have the time and the resources to dedicate to this channel, utilize them. But mandated, it's, you know, uh, Facebook and Twitter, those are the top dogs by far. If you have time for Pinterest, Google+, Plus, feel free. But again, you don't want to just take the same message and distribute it across all four channels because it's, it's just not appropriate. It's not used the same way. Yeah. So you, you vary messaging from one medium to the next. Um, when you're on the road and you're traveling, 
How do you use social media? I have definitely, I use Twitter to meet people. A lot of times I'll put out like, you know, I'm in this city now, does anyone have recommendations? A lot of times people will come and say, oh, check out this restaurant, go to this cafe. Isn't that amazing? Other times people say, I have a friend who's there, or I'm living there, if you want to meet up for coffee. So I've met a lot of people through Twitter. I that. Yeah. Um, I also, I mean, I do couch surfing and a few other kind of websites like that where you meet people, but Facebook, I definitely keep Facebook to my real life friends. Um, and I do have a page that I just kind of share kind of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like I said, I think a lot of people follow me and they want to kind of see what I'm up to. So I try to be very um, prolific with updates on like Instagrams and check-ins so that people can see what I'm doing and where I'm going and that I'm taking their tips. Well, you know, that's a, a good segue. Maybe you could tell us a little bit how you got into um, travel blogging and, and a little bit more about, um, you know, how that progression started. Yeah, I, right after I finished up at Chico State, I took a backpacking trip around Europe by myself for five weeks, and I had a very dear mom, this is what I did today, sort of wordpress.com blog. Um, and when I got back and started working in Silicon Valley, a lot of my friends said how much they really enjoyed reading it. Um, so when I did decide to quit my job in Silicon Valley to move to France, which had been a dream of mine, I was kind of like, might as well take it to the next level, see what could happen. I started following a lot of travel blogs and had started interacting <coughs> with them and on Twitter, actually, and it kind of just seemed like the next logical step would be to start blogging myself. And that was two years ago. Um, and since then, I've lived in the French Riviera, uh, I lived in Australia, and I traveled around. Europe and Southeast Asia um, and Australia, so it's kind of just grown along with me in a very nice way. And what, um, what, what, is, what's your typical day like as a travel blogger? What does that, what does that end up like, and who do you interact with? Uh, I try to wake up early and go on Reader and go through all the blogs that I follow, uh, respond to comments, respond to tweets, reply to emails, get all that out of the way. Like a business. Yeah, I do all that in the morning so that I can go and enjoy wherever I am. Um, like I said, I just got back from a month in, 10 months in Australia, a month in Indonesia, a month in Thailand, and a month in Vietnam. So every day was very different. It might have been doing a cooking class or going on a bike tour or going to the beach, a lot, a lot of beaches. Um, and then sometimes it's just walking around a new city with a camera and going to a new restaurant and trying to soak up as much of that local culture as I can, um, and then coming home at night and writing a lot. Um, <laughs> so I try and look for accommodation with free Wi-Fi. That's, <laughs> that's all I look for, <laughs> really, free batch Wi-Fi. That's all. Um, <laughs> it's all we want, Lucas, is free Wi-Fi. Sign up for FTC. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. All right. But how do you go about traveling, uh, planning travel? And, and then I think that re uh, relates to, to those of you that are, you know, in the agency side of things. What, what do you use? What apps are you using? How do you find out information about where to go, what to see, what to do? Um, yeah, I just had a really long day trying to figure out flights. Um, <laughs> two days ago, I spent like four hours trying to figure out flights from like France to Croatia, the dates and time. So I'm, it's not always easy. And it does take time. I was going to say, it's, it's 
GoGoBot sort of monitors your your Foursquare check-ins, and then it will send you an email and say, "Hey, you checked in at these five places that were new. Come back and give them a review, or tell us, you know, write some information about it." And then they have all these all these images, community images that are in there too. So it'll tie it to an image, or if you have your own images, you can put your own images on there. Uh, and then you basically log all the places that you've gone. So I, you know, I'll take a little bit of notes, but really all I do is just everywhere I go, I check in on Foursquare. And then I know when I get back, I'm going to get a reminder from GoGoBot to go and fill it in. And then it creates a, uh, a trip log of that destination when I get there. So now when I'm on Facebook or whatever and I see someone say, oh, I'm going to, so my latest one was Vancouver. Uh, you know, I did this uh, for this Young Professional Society group that I'm in. Uh, we did a, a four-day trip in Vancouver where we did everything. Went to, tasted all the food on Granville Island, went skiing, it, did everything. And so I checked in everywhere on Foursquare, and then I logged it out religiously. And then I had someone on Facebook go, oh, I'm going to Vancouver. Does anyone have any recommendations? I said a link. I said, hey, here's my trip log on GoGoBot. Oh, and they went good. through, and they saw all my favorite restaurants we ate at, the, you know, where to go for, you know, how to get up the mountain if you want to go skiing on Cypress Mountain. All that stuff is all on my GoGoBot trip. That's a great. That's a great. So I really like that. I'm using all my power not to get on my phone right this second. I know. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to find it in the back of the room. So it's very just <laughs> for <laughs> so No, that's so good. Julie, what about you when it comes to, um, you know, what apps and, and things you're using to plan out um, travel and, and such? Well, I am um, not a big fan of the consolidator type of um, Kayak and Expedia and Hotels.com and those kind of things because my personal experience, I previously, a long time ago, I was a travel agent. And so I kind of have in my own mind um, some basic knowledge about where places are, that kind of thing. And I stayed at a hotel in Carmel a few years ago where I got the room on Hotels.com and the hotel told me when I got there that the system that they used at Hotels.com was to fax the hotel a message that you were coming. And so that night, <laughs> someone else got walked out of the hotel because I got there before they did. And my fax was, you know, on the floor where the faxes would come in and the person said, you know, someone did not correctly update the hotel inventory to Hotels.com. So I personally, I prefer, in general, to go to the source. I want to go to the hotel's um, website because I want to see what the photos are, the full package of what they have, and very rarely is the price any better on one of those sites. So if I use those sites, sometimes I'll use it to find out who still has inventory, and then I will go directly to the place and book it um, with, you know, go on to the Fairmont's website or go on to whoever's website there is. Because I know that then it's, I know I've got a room when I get there. Walking people from a hotel happens all the time, especially through a, a third party website maybe because a hotel is going to overbook and they don't know how serious everybody is and they need <coughs> people to show up. We use a lot of, um, wholesalers and consolidators like Classic Vacations, for example, who guarantee they'll never walk our client. They make the property agree to that guarantee. If the property won't agree to never walk the client, they won't contract with the client. Am I gonna send honeymooners to a beautiful resort in Maui and take the chance that their 9 p.m. arrival means they're not gonna get their room? It's never gonna happen. So I'm tweeting the property, I'm Facebooking the property, and I'm booking through a source that not only guarantees them best room, best view, best price, but then they're not going to get walked. I mean, that's huge. That's huge for us. That sounds like a lot of yeah. variations. When it when it comes to, I, I noticed when you guys are talking about, you know, how you're planning out travel, does anyone, you, do, do any, what's your take on, on review sites like Yelp or TripAdvisor? I know when I'm um, planning trips or if I just go away for a week and I, I might, my phone, I'll look and see who's yelping. What, what's, what's been your experience with using it to travel? I, I would like to talk about that because just last week, last month in the um, London Guardian was a big article about TripAdvisor mm -hmm. and one of the um, responses from a hotel, uh, a commentary in a, to the article 
was about how this um, bed and breakfast was consistently a four-star property that they had a really good reputation and people loved them and you know for a long time it was a quality business and they got a terrible trip advisor um, review and it affected their business so much that they had to lay off a staff member so when people get in you know the the way that Yelp and TripAdvisor especially Yelp where they kind of it's almost encouraged to be snarky and so people are um, people either love someplace or they totally hate it and nothing could be worse in the entire world than this mm -hmm. place that they went you want to go excuse me I've been there it's not that bad yeah well, I, always, I think if you look at it it's I mean you can see the psychology behind it right I mean it t it's it's a little bit of work to write a review on something. Mm -hmm. So really, you've got to have some sort of motivation to do There's it. There's passion in and one really, direction. Yeah, and yeah your motivation is either going to be you had the worst experience of your life or the best experience of your life. It's right? like three people will tell if they have a really good experience. Nine people will complain. So it's no surprise that those are going to have more bad reviews because they feel so badly about it that they want to tell people. Right? Yeah. Yeah. My brother-in-law owns a nightclub in San Francisco. And it's called Atmosphere, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's uh, and you can look all the nightclubs in San Francisco. They're all three star ratings, and it's always because there's you know people that love it, and then there's always the one group in line that didn't get in, or something happened. They got too drunk and they got kicked out, or whatever, and all ten of them go on Yelp and put one star and talk about how everyone there is mean and all this stuff, and it's usually all around one sort of event. Yeah. Uh, Lucas, on your side of things, since you're a property and you are the recipient of Yelp or whatever, uh, any type of review, what's your take on it? What, have you had good experiences? How have you responded to negative experiences? So for the most part, it's been mostly positive. Um, out of all our reviews, probably 75% come from TripAdvisor. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are, for the most part, positive. Um, we do get about 15% of our uh, reviews from Yelp. And I'll respond to about 50% of those, give or take, um, for both channels. But what we found is that whereas TripAdvisor gives 75% of our uh, reviews, maybe 10% of those people will respond to my response. Whereas on Yelp, which is only 10 to 15%, half of those people will respond. TripAdvisor, on the other hand, also uh, people have read my responses to other people and have contacted me in advance of even booking. Uh, so that's been something that's very interesting. And generally, it's you know I have some concerns about the property. I read this, ex you know, etc. And then I can correspond with them, and then they'll say, okay, great, you've put my fears at ease. Great, go ahead and vote. And and if and if someone on the off chance that someone has a negative experience, how do you usually relate to that? Because I mean, we've seen there's always some great story about how some business went off and and after someone went off on them. So wh how do you, how do you respond? Do you respond? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I think, I think it, it's, it's one of those things, it's human psychology. It, the worst thing you can do with someone complaining is ignore them. That's mm -hmm. only gonna anger them more. Um, and then it, it just shows you don't care. So other people would see that you wrote a bad review, I had every chance in the world to respond and I didn't, then they think I don't care. So definitely we respond to both positive and negative uh, reviews. It's amazing the customer service aspect and the relationship building aspect that you all seem to be talking about with, um, as far as all these tools go. Um, you know, maybe we could talk a little about some of the, the best practices you've seen. Who's doing what? Maybe um, either give me an example of, of people that people or companies that you think are really in the travel industry, really doing it well, people to watch or some great experience that you've had from your own personal experience. Um, do, you, do you want to start off? Um, put you on the spot. Well, a, um, I have no answer. Okay. <laughs> um, does anyone want to jump in? Well, so for me, what I one that I think that does it well Maybe not so much, uh, you know, I don't have experience from a customer service experience, but from showcasing their product, I really like what uh, Disney Parks does. Uh, they do, because they're a massive, massive company, you know, one of the largest companies in the world, but their Facebook stuff is so personal and so sort of small scale. It's, it, it makes you feel like you're, you know, in the inside circle 
because they're showing you like little behind the scene things on the new ride they have coming out or uh, you know pictures of people like getting their getting to meet the princesses or you know stuff that you know and but my kids are uh, my twin boys they're four and they're into Disney stuff and so there's lots of times I'm seeing stuff that Disney puts up that oh, I gotta show you this check this out uh, my one son he loves all of the Disney princesses like his, they're, they're, they're the greatest. And so whenever there's like neat stuff with princesses, he's always like, oh, that's so cool. Can I print that picture, Dad? Right, hate the player, not the game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. 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 On a local level, I've actually never stayed there, but I follow The Citizen um, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. on Twitter and their blog. I check out their wedding blog every once in a while just because it's really pretty. Um, yeah, pictures? like some big, gorgeous pictures. And I just think that they do a really good job because I have eaten at Crane and I do like that, so I follow them on Twitter mm -hmm. and I check in them on Forrester and everything else and I think they do a really great job of kind of giving interesting content to someone who's just in the Sacramento area who I live here like I have no reason to yeah. stay at the Citizen but they're always very front of mind simply because of their efforts on social media. Yeah. Who, um, you mentioned earlier that you when you on your day to day you, you check up on your, your favorite travel bloggers who are you following like who is like these are my favorite travel blogs this is inspiration we should have had a syllabus to distribute with all these great <laughs> I know. references. Huh? I, was, I mean, mine are definitely um, skew more towards budget travel. 20-something travel is one that I followed for a really long time. Um, and I know Stephanie, and she's really great at giving good destination uh, information. The Road Forks just has gorgeous photography. It's a bit more food-focused, which I like. Um, oh there's so many. Lover? I do follow Land Lopers, okay. that's a good one. Land Lopers? Land Lopers. Land Lopers. Matt, do you follow Matt? Do you no, know I him? don't. I don't, I don't follow him. <laughs> do you know I, Matt? I know him and I actually have. Okay. I don't that's think he's cool. a very good writer and I have followed him and I stopped because he's a bad writer. <laughs> okay. But he's a book deal, so that's yeah. good for him. Yeah. What um, about you, because you sound like you've got a couple of favorites on you. Um, I follow a lot of different things for a lot of different reasons. I follow an update whenever there's an earthquake anywhere in the world. And it's not because I'm morbid, but I like to know if we have clients somewhere, if things going to affect their travels. Um, I follow Heathrow Airport and San Francisco Airport, so I'm aware of delays. And so that's really... So it, you can filter different categories. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, we were able to really spring into action when the um, ash cloud happened that came over Iceland what was that, two years ago, get people on trains headed down south to fly them out of Europe before all of Europe was locked. And that was by seeing Twitter report. When I woke up and was getting the kid up for school and looked at 5 a.m. and saw that they were expecting airports to be shut down, we just contact our agent and say, yeah, Let's start moving it. now. We have to look after our clients. And Are, are there yeah. any other brands that you guys are seeing that um, you think, whether they're in travel or not, are just really engaging well, um, or, or bloggers that you think are really um, <laughs> well, um, I have a friend, Sheila Beal, who is Go Visit Hawaii, mm -hmm. and she um, is a spectacular source if you're having a Hawaii trip. I mean, I don't, she lives in North Carolina, which I think is kind of an interesting thing, that <laughs> yeah. she knows more about Hawaii than my friends who, have, you know, have been going there since they were young, but, you know, she's fabulous. Another friend of mine is Beth Whitman, who has Wanderlust and Lipstick, which is a um, a large site and specializes in um, women travel and she um, particularly leads tours like to Bhutan and so she's um, you know she's kind of a um, you know outdoorsy um, exotic type of thing and sh she is also the person that is the um, one of four people that started the Passports with Purpose um, fundraiser that um, this year um, built um, two or maybe three. They raised we raised enough money to build multiple libraries in Africa. <laughs> they built a village. They I mean it's it's a really fabulous program. So through that group, I've met a lot of people, and and on their passports with purpose site is all the people who contributed. So I'll sometimes go through and just click on people that, you know, and meet new people through that. 
Yeah. I'll just say yeah. one more that I remember that's one of my favorites. She just doesn't post very often, so she's not top of mind. But legal no bads, if you're looking for amazing travel writing and really good travel photography, it's yeah. gorgeous food photography. And I met Jody and Thailand and she's They're called legal nomads? Legal nomads, yeah. She <laughs> used to be a lawyer and she's been traveling for four years, but that's mm -hmm. one uh, I recommend. Sounds like a good life change. Um, Lucas, how about you? Any any ones that you are following that in the industry just kill it? Um, in the industry, one one that's I've been to other conferences and they've kind of been identified. Their nickname, they're known as the Social Media Hotel, is the Roger Smith Hotel in New York. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that they talk about that they do is they don't have just a single voice for their social media presence. Um, they have a guy who that's his specific job, but then they also have a concierge that posts, a bellman that posts, you know, a housekeeper that posts. Is it a different? Um, is it a different name, or do they have like different tags? No, just in um, within within their Facebook page. I know on, on Twitter they identify themselves. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't remember if they do on Facebook. Um, but they, whereas I generally try and stick to one post a day. Uh, sometimes I'll post upwards of four to six times a day. Um, another one is Virgin America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you like about Virgin? Their responsiveness and. I, by nature, I'm pretty, well, snarky would be a good word. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I just like the irreverence of it. The tone, um, yeah. yeah, the tone, exactly. And and the speed with which they respond. And they incorporate, they try and incorporate their their uh, crowd as much as possible, you know, with things like having their uh, their fans name their plane, et cetera, mm -hmm. running flash sales for an hour. Are they the ones doing the, um, who's doing the beer? Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, Virgin Australia is the same. If you ever go to Australia, they're mm -hmm. a great airline to fly, and they're great on Twitter. They're responsive. Yeah. What about you, Ryan? Uh, well, I, I, I'm the same way. I like the snark. I like the funny stuff is what sticks with me. Funny, yeah, quirky, too. unique. Um, I get bored. Like I see so much travel stuff and everything all day that I get bored with just the same pictures and content and information. But the stuff that sticks, like I love Bamf Squirrel. Uh -huh. People her, like yeah. I absolutely love that, and I love like she's so clever. Like the the whole thing when the the New York Zoo python escaped, mm -hmm. and so then she was hiding and stuff. I mean that was mm -hmm. awesome. I'm not familiar with that one. Is that it's so it's the Banff the Tourism Board, I think that that's the what spot, but it's yeah, it's from the point of view of a squirrel in Banff. <laughs> and so, so is that the one with the photo bomb the couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so, the squirrel changes outfits. Yeah, occasionally. Basically, and oh. celebrates it. The squirrel's really weird. It, it totally thinks like a squirrel. Uh, so I like imaginative things like that, where it's uh, you know, it's more than just you know, here's information or here's whatever. It's from sort of a a, a certain perspective, and then it tries to be kind of funny or different. That's great. And uh, then I just want to mention yeah. the Gem Hotel in New York. It's a few gems, but the Gem Hotel in New York will have give up their Twitter to um, celebrity guests. So they'll say, "Today, Brian Posehn's operating our Twitter account or something." So it'll usually a stand-up comedian, and they'll just once in a while blast out something like, uh, "You know, we're not responsible for what he's saying." And it's really <laughs> funny and totally <laughs> silly, but I love following that. So, so how do you go about developing your own voice? If you're new um, to to using social media, or you know your your company has just finally said you can go ahead and use these channels, how do you start to, to develop your voice? Um, or as a blogger, how do you start developing? You know, what tone? What do you share? How do how do you best manage your time on on um, that? And and you know, honestly, it sounds like a lot of people that you love following, you actually enjoy it, and there's an element of fun to it. So how do you establish that? I think one of the best things someone who I met via Twitter ever said to me in real life, she's like, you sound just like you do on your blog, like in real life. You sound the same way, you write the same way that you talk. And to, for me, that's always just been how I want to be. I want to, I never want to be surprised when people meet me in real life and be like, oh, that's who I've been reading like <laughs> years, really? <laughs> um, so I just try and be, yeah, as me as possible. And I've been doing more posts lately that are, can, I don't want to say funnier, but kind of more a look into my life, less of just like, oh, this is where I went. And people are responding a lot, really well to them, and you know, saying that was really funny. Oh, all right, fair enough. So doing more of that, just trying to be myself, for better or for worse. Um, my site is things you should do, and it's not things you shouldn't do. So <laughs> I um, sort of my background is that I 
have always been a person who had a very strong relationship with small businesses. And so I only am positive. If, if I only write about places I like, I write about places that, you know, enthusiastically about what they're like. If people, I'm not particularly interested in providing a platform for people to criticize businesses. So that's not my gig is how to, you know, if someone writes a bad comment to say, you know, I just erase them. This is my house and you can't come. <laughs> You're not invited to come and do that. So um, I, um, I sort of was inspired as I'm kind of the anti-Yelp. That was what inspired me was people are too mean. And I, um, you know, that's how I am in, in life, in, or I try to be. And, you know, people, I get crabby too, but, you know, I, in general, that's not what I want to so it's still kind emphasize. Of extension of you. You, yeah, you, I mean, people know, like people know that I'm like, oh, this is so great, and you want to, you know, that's yeah. how I am. So I think, um, you know, when people ask me about, oh, I want to get started, what I do, and I run into a lot of these travel agents. They're like, I don't understand the Facebook. You know, what? How do I? How do I get on this? <laughs> or you know, uh, or this tweetering, or you know, they, they all these. Things. And so, I always tell them three things. One is, you know, screw being professional. You know, be yourself. Uh, professional is boring. You, you know, if you're professional, sterile. Nobody wants to read that. They want to get to know you. So. You know, being personal is important. Have a goal, like figure out what it is that you're, why you're gonna be on there. If you're just gonna go and be on Twitter because you heard other people are on Twitter and so you wanna go be on there, you're gonna fail miserably. You, you gotta know what you want. Do you want to make new friends? Are you looking to identify potential clients in a certain area? And the more specific you can be, the better. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the third thing, it, Christine hit on it really well in what she said, but she didn't say it as a recognition. Look at other people. You know, go and go out there and search out the other people that that you like, and then say, what are they doing that I like? What makes me like them that they're doing? Mm -hmm. And then you know, pick that stuff up too. Pattern yourself after that. You know, I like that this person posts once a day in the morning and not seven times a day. So then I'm not going to post seven times a day. Mm -hmm. I like that there are lots of pictures on this and it's not too much to read. So then. Be like that, you know, do what you like, uh, and you can find what you like by looking what's out there, because there's so much out there. Yeah, I think it's really important to just be, as cliche it is to say, to just be very authentic uh, and be yourself, because it's it's really easy to spot out a fake online, and, and you know, if someone's just being overly salesy or corporate-y, that's, that's the type of thing, there's such an inundation of information that people are gonna get turned off to that really quickly. Well, the mistake I made for the first six months we were on Twitter was I tried to keep it this sort of generic, <clears throat> mass, corporate, and that's not who we are. We're in an emotional relationship to the business. And so I thought, well, I started following, like you said, people that I admired and watched how they were using Twitter and how they were using Facebook. And, you know, it's okay to say, this drink looks delicious and here's how you make it, and because that's how I feel. And, and so, like what you said, sort of being authentic and watching other people do it and sort of adopting the way they do it. Because I'm a lot more authentic on Twitter. I've been on Twitter before I started blogging as a personal thing, so that tends to just be my stream of thoughts. And I got bed bugs when I was in Asia, and that was awful. And I complained about it on Twitter for probably like four days straight. Yeah. And everyone was like, are you going to write about it? Are you going to write about it? And I was like, people don't want to read about that. And then <laughs> I did, and it was just like, this is awful. But people were like, okay, fair enough. Like, it happens, and that's part of the thing is you can't just show, like, oh, I went to the beach for all week last week. Like, yeah, I also got bed bugs, and it was yeah. bad. What, um, what trends do you think are going to be, uh, like, coming up next? I mean, it's a good foundation on where to start and how to find your voice, but what do you see as the, maybe not necessarily the next big thing, but what do you see as, as either tools or best practices, things that I, you think are really going to help change, um, you know, travel through social media? I'll leave it up there. Uh, well, I think that people, um, the people in the travel business um, are going to have to step in a lot stronger than what they are now. Even people who are active in social media are going to have to become more active because it is 
um, it's too um, pervasive of a communication method. If you're not there, you know, to answer questions and, and to get into the conversation, then a small business, they've got to figure out how to make the time to do it because it, otherwise they're just missing. You know from your own clients in the downtown partnership that if someone's not participating, they are seeing a decrease in revenue. So you got to play, get it, you got to get in the game. What other trends are you are you guys seeing? Um, seeing a bit, uh, I think this is going to be something you'll see over the next few years is a, more of a resurgence of the expert. I think uh, you know there was all this stuff about the intelligence of crowds and the mass, and you know with things like Yelp and TripAdvisor and all, and basically saying, well, let's just have the anonymous masses guide decision making and. Lowest that, common denominator. And, well, and <laughs> so a couple of things happened out of that. One is uh, the crowd got really big, so it got kind of unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And also lots of people with not so pure motives saw easy ways to sort of move that, you know, with the astroturfing stuff that was happening on TripAdvisor and, mm -hmm. you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, anonymous, anonymous reviews are, you know, sort of going away and it's funny because you'll see there's so many tools that are coming out right now that are sort of trying to make that stuff easy um, where you it's like okay well you know you say you want to plan a trip and it's going to go out to all of your Twitter friends and your Facebook friends and they're going to help you plan your trip okay but at least me most of my friends I've been way more places than they've been right and so they're not going to help me so much with the trip uh, and then you know you sort of see the anonymous stuff. You don't know if that person is going to be someone that's like you or you know not like you or opposite. And I think you know what's going to come out of that is we're going to come back to having people that are travel experts, and they're going to come out of these people who are travel bloggers and you know travel agents who are actually out traveling and studying and learning about this stuff. That's going to get sort of re-embraced, and the next stage of things that are going to come out are going to be ways from connecting the person who's saying, you know, I'm a busy person. I don't have all day to Google everything there is to know about Thailand and spend four hours looking for airline tickets on Kayak and Expedia and Orbitz and whatever because it's all too expensive. Uh, and so things will gravitate back towards saying, here's how these tools enable you to have an easier connection with people who know what they're doing about this stuff. Any other trends? I think the two, two of the biggest things are going to be um, mobile as, as smartphones are you know ever increasing in popularity uh, as well as tablets making sure that websites are mobile friendly uh, mm -hmm. and ease of discovery on mobile is critical mm -hmm. and then the other thing I think whatever whatever channels come out that can prove an ROI because that's what everyone wants to know it's yeah. like what's the RO, ROI of social media a lot of sites you just don't know just whether they mark. say they yeah exactly at least with us, um, we tag, I put code on every single post, so when I go into Google Analytics, I can see what posts have driven, uh, how many posts have driven, how many users to a site, to my site, and if there has been e-commerce associated with that, that's directly attributable. That's great. Any other comments, and then we can open up to questions? So, so there's something uh, I don't personally generate. I we have a template that I just enter in some information that spits out the code that you attach. Um, if you have Google Analytics on your site, it should be pretty straightforward. Yeah, or you can use something like um, Bitly um, does that kind of stuff. Or uh, as a, a social media tool, there's a tool called Hootsuite that will. Tag all, it'll, what it does is it takes all your links and it shortens them, but when it uses that shortened link, it puts a little marker on that link to say, we're going to see how many people actually come back to this link from this particular post. Okay. And if you have the um, professional version of Hootsuite, then it gives you a longer time period for that um, analytics to live. If you're using the, the free version of Hootsuite, it doesn't um, give you that much detail yeah. Um, but the, the upgraded versions are not that expensive. It also knows you have multiple people yeah. on mm -hmm. the same account. So if you work for a, a property, you have multiple people using it. For example. 
It at least seems to last a long time. I can yeah, go back and look yeah. at those yeah. analytics for a long time. There's another one called Sprout Social, too. That the, I think the, the analytics are a little bit deeper than what you get from Hootsuite. The, um, the actual posting tools aren't necessarily as nice, but I like the analytics better. Um, I have two questions similarly associated. So one is, I was going to ask about the conversion, like how do you track, you know, from our, from the side of being the travel person trying, the destination, trying to get people there, how do you track that? Or how do you, do you make certain messages to where you can kind of see how, if somebody actually, people can like you all day long and they can retweet you all day long, but are they buying a ticket? Are they coming to the place? You know, is there a way that you track that or how do you see that? But the smaller question was Bitly. I didn't know that there's analytics associated with that. Space. It just gives okay. you back the, uh, okay. if you create on the site, you can go back and see who's clicked on the links okay. and stuff. Yeah, how many or how many people have clicked the links. And then ge geographically, where they clicked from. Yeah. If, in answer to your question about um, tracking the um, the ROI on the tools, I think the, the hardest part about um, the tracking on travel is that most people um, have a longer time period that they think about where they're going to go. And so, you know, if I write a blog post, it might be something that, um, you know, a year later, the person is going to take action. And, you know, there's a lot of talk in the internet about, you know, how do you track that um, so that the last click doesn't get the credit for a um, interest that you've created for a long time. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you might um, write about um, the Sonoma Mission Inn and um, a whole year later, somebody sees a Google ad on the Sonoma Mission Inn and they click on that and the Google ad gets the credit for generating the thing. It's, I don't know how people um, solve that problem unless they have a really um, big budget where they can track it really, you know, Yeah, I think it's really about, you know, being narrow with your call to action. I mean, first of all, having a call to action, right? You want, um, I mean, if you're doing it, if you're trying to measure marketing ROI, what you're putting out there, you've got to be explicitly directing them to do something so that then you can measure, <laughs> did they actually do that thing? How effective was this in getting them to do it? And it may not be, you know, uh, it's hard to put up, you know, a Twitter message or something and get that to get someone to book a hotel night. I mean, you could, you could say, you know, if you book now, it's a free night and, you know, you still would have trouble penetrating just because that's, there's so much noise and there's so much stuff going on. But uh, if it's something as simple as, you know, click here to, you know, read details or, you know, follow more about this or get to know us or, you know, some sort of active thing that, that pushes them towards an action, then you can look at the effects from that action as long as you're, you know, follow, you know following it with something, sending them to a link or, or doing something like that, asking them to retweet asking them specifically to go like your Facebook page or, you know, click, you know, like on this message if, you know, you, you, and you'll see it with some of the ones that do a good job. They'll say, you know, here's a picture of a sunrise, click like if you like sunrises. Instead of just saying, here's a picture of a sunrise and being swiped, how come so nobody clicks like on this? In action. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Um, any other questions? I see one in the back. Yeah, I just had a question. I wanted to get your insight on the emergence of like Groupon and Living Social with all of their travel deals. How is that affecting um, the travel industry? What are your experiences and where do you see it going? <laughs> yeah. I actually have a. Uh, so, the, from I when they first started getting into the travel deal stuff, I, I'm like, the, okay, this is interesting. I'm going to start checking this out and see what they're doing. If they're really able to throw the weight that they say they are, that they do, because I don't have a very high opinion of Groupon and, and those kind of sites, because I feel like they sort of bully a lot of small businesses into giving them deals that are bad for the small business. And I knew that there's no way they're going to be able to pull that with like the Fairmont. You know, they can't, they're not going to be able to bully a big hotel or Maui into like giving them something like that. So they, they publish these things that'll say, oh, this is a big discount trip. You're getting 60% off. Well, I watched it for a couple of weeks, and I ran every single trip that they did, and I could beat every single price that they had, even though they were calling it 
fifty percent off. And I actually had a, uh, I have a friend who's an Ireland specialist, and they did a uh, and he lives in Portland, Maine, and they did a uh, a trip that was all about Ireland, and it was like, oh, we have this deep discount, sixty percent off. And he looked at it, and he's like, well, first of all, that's not very cheap, and second of all, I'd never have you stay two days here and two days here because that'd be a total waste of your time. You're going to want to spend all your time in this uh, this town, and I would never use that carrier to take you on your transfers because they're notoriously unreliable. And you don't get any of that stuff when you look at Groupon or you know Living Social. You get a paragraph <coughs> that usually has no details. All it is is focused around making you laugh. It's so great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And uh, Mr. Yeah. Do you find those to be helpful or that's much? I've never used it for that. Um, I will say that I did start, I had a friend, we went to Chicago, and she's a huge Groupon lover. And so she started following the Groupon for Chicago, and she knew that we were going. And so she got us like a year-long ticket to go up the John Hancock Tower for the same price of cheaper than a ticket would have been for the day. So she bought it. We had that ready to go when we went. Yeah, I don't really follow them. But I will say that I have friends who aren't big travelers, who now that Groupon is doing travel things, they're like, oh, maybe I'll do a weekend away because I saw it on a Groupon. And to me, is someone like, go travel, do it. I'm like, if they're going to make that easier for you, that's awesome. One last question, I think, then we have to wrap up. I well, it. it's a kind of a related question. So whether it's Groupon or a comparison site or flights or, you know, whatever it is, do you guys find either from a traveler perspective or from the vendor perspective that you can get the deals, the same deals matched or less deals, should you I, call directly yeah. or? I always, I book from the source, but I do use them to kind of get an idea. Um, but I'll always, if it's a hotel, I'll contact the hotel directly because you never know. You get better service too. I feel like then once I email, if I email a hotel, they get back to me, then I have their email ready. If anything comes up, if I need to contact them, then I'm gonna be late. Um, if I can get a better room, if they have Wi-Fi, I can ask questions and then you know exactly what you're getting. So I use them for research, but I rarely book on any sort of aggregate site. I, I had a um, hotel owner tell me that um, almost always he could match or better the price that was on any aggregator, aggregator and he personally, <laughs> um, and he personally made about 15% more to the hotel. So. You know, he wasn't giving up such a big share of his income, which, you know, the travel business in general is operating on such low margins now that those people, they need that 15% in order for the business to still be in business two years from now. And from the travel agent perspective, comparing apples to apples, there is, I would say 99% of the time, there's nothing we can't get. There's no deal that we don't have access to. You pay no more to use a professional than you use to go direct. Oftentimes we see some magical price and then look at what it really includes and find out that it doesn't include the $75 each way cab ride to and from the property. And ours might have come out $35 more, but ours includes that transportation. Um, there's such parity within the travel industry Cruise lines aren't going to let a website undercut hoteliers. I mean, Lucas doesn't want anybody undercutting them, and they'd like to know that the person they're booking is serious. And so from our perspective, there's just nothing we can't get. And we're really careful about looking at all the details to make sure that the price quoted is really the bottom line, the true bottom line. Well, and I'll take that one further. For uh, I was reading an article talking about uh, travel suppliers' relationships with travel agents. It's sort of this little-known secret that people don't really know is businesses cater towards their best customers. And travel suppliers' best customers are travel agents or, and the people who book through travel agents because they actually have real finite data that shows that people who book through travel agents tend to spend more when they're on property. They, uh, you know, they're, they, spend, they tend to buy higher rooms. They, so they want to cater to the travel agents. When we call them up, they listen. They do stuff for us. Uh, if you if you're calling them directly, they're not they don't re, you don't have the kind of leverage we have because you're you know you may come back there again some other time in the, the future, but you don't necessarily represent extra business whether we do through our agency or you know if we're part of we're part of a larger buying group that uh, is actually all North American. 
So we have that kind of leverage to, you know, so we can always get you whatever price you're seeing online and that kind of stuff. But then we also, uh, on top of that, we can usually leverage them to throw in things like breakfasts and spa credits and those kinds of things because of our relationship with them. I mean, they're, uh, they're coming to us. They come into my office and say, how can, you know, how can I get more of your clients to come to stay at my hotel? Or whatever, and so then they're offering things up to that. I don't think people really realize that. Well, it, you know, I, I think that sounds like some great insight that we all can use for traveling, planning travel, and, and looking at different opportunities. Um, it looks like we're about out of time, and so I want to first off, before we finish off, thank each of our panelists. You guys have been fantastic. <laughs> as a travel blogger, um, one of the main things that I like to do on my site is have guest bloggers. And I have the information if anyone has a favorite restaurant or a favorite hotel or a spa or a golf course or wherever that they've been and they'd like to write about it. And I'd link back to you or your site or your Twitter stream and um, get some publicity for some nice place. So. <laughs> Go to the hotel. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'm Laura Good. For those of you who didn't see me in the back room when Scott was talking, I am the um, president of Social Media Club. We encourage you, as we end the panel, to um, stick around and continue the conversations. I think our panelists will, uh, will hang out for a while, and there's more food and beverages up front. Um, I did want to, uh, because I'm president, I get to tell you my special reflection on what you were talking about here. When I graduated from college, I went on a three-month trip to Europe, but that was before Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> so, <laughs> my Bible was something called Let's Go to Europe. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, um, I just imagine how different that trip would be today mm -hmm. if internet and smartphones and whatnot. Well, it wouldn't be on five dollars a day today. <laughs> yeah, it would not be on five. I think I, I was there for for three months, and including my round trip airfare, I think I spent less than two thousand wow. dollars. Um, anyway, so there's my story. <laughs> so again, I want to thank um, the Golden Bear for bringing and, uh, Sacramento Press, I think Chris is around here somewhere now for uh, bringing the beverages that, that we enjoyed. And I also, um, I'd like to thank the Social Media Club team, where Scott told you we're an all-volunteer team and we're passionate about social media, so that's that's why we try and put fun events like this together. So if you're on the leadership team, would you just raise your hand? Special shout out to Jamila. This was her first panel discussion that she has put together, and I think she did. Um, and without further ado, we'll get to the raffle prizes. And we have um, Christy and Kelsey are going to do that. You should all have get your tickets out. Must be present to win. Yeah. All right. So the first one we have. Um, Oh, that would be um, Family passes, which admits four. So we have two of these. So the first one is a $40 value to the Crocker Art Museum. So one is So that one will go to 547615. Are you? Back there. Back there.